Welcome to New Branch Community Church. We're glad that you're here today, and uh, we welcome those that are joining us online and by phone today. We're so glad you guys can be with us as well. I'd like to start today with a question. Have you ever been, have you ever been down? Anybody ever been down? <laughs> oh, wow, some people are raising their hands. That's okay. That's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? When, when I mean down, I don't mean like you just had a bad day. I mean like down like, you know. I'm at the end of my rope, you know. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, and now nobody can put this back together again. You get it, and the egg is so scrambled. I don't know possibly what we could do. You know, in fact, I got a picture here for you. Can you all see that? <laughs> Does anybody know who that is? <laughs> Wally Coyote. I got the right crowd, right? And, and you've had that moment where you feel like, hey, in life, I've just kind of ran off the cliff, and you know, Wally Coyote, he doesn't realize it until he's off the cliff, and then he's kind of like hit this realization that. This is bad. Anybody been there? Anybody been, been the one fallen or hit the ground? Maybe there he is at the bottom after he explodes. And he's got a little sign that says, help. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> help me. <laughs> and, and, and in those moments, you're thinking in your mind, I got the sign that says help, but I really don't think anybody could help. Anybody ever felt that way? And then, and then during those times, maybe you feel like the words that you see over here that say, you know, you know, hate, solitude, des- despair, fear, loneliness, aching. There's all kinds of words that go along with it. Maybe, maybe you got your own list of words. But, but during that time, has anybody ever decided that, you know what, maybe, maybe I'll go to church today? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys are raising your hand. That's good. That's fine. You can participate. That's good. Because I'm one of those too. I, I did that during those times. And, and, and maybe you thought in your mind, I go, I don't know for sure that if I go to church today, it's going to make any difference at all in my life, but maybe I'll just try it and see what happens. And you, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And, and the question I have for you is this, is when you went during that time where you walk in, and some of you know, and I've watched some of you because I know, and I understand what it's like because I did the exact same thing when I was going through that kind of time in my life. And by the way, it doesn't mean you never will again, okay? Hmm. That, that you come in and it's kind of like, I don't know that I even want to go in that place. You know what I mean? And, and, and in your mind, you've already mentally assented to, hey, I'm going to go to church today. And you pull in the parking lot and there's this feeling that goes, I don't know that I want to go in there. <laughs> Anybody ever got to the parking lot and then turned around and went home? <laughs> yeah. You didn't know that I knew that, did you? <laughs> we know. Why? Because I've done it too. Where you go, I don't want to see those people. And as soon as you see that smiling face at the door, not picking on you, you know. <laughs> but a smiling face at the door, which is great. And you're going, I don't think I can do this, you know. And you leave and you come back or, or, you, or, you, or, you, or you come in early and you're like, man, I can't just sit in this place and it's empty and people are trying to talk to me. And you just go back out and get on your cell phone or whatever. You know what I mean? Because it's like, I just can't handle it. But I'm just hoping that maybe, just maybe, there's something, you know? <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm just hoping there is. I don't really even believe there is, but maybe there's something there. So, if you did that, how did it go? How did it work out for you? <laughs> huh? Well, if you tried it, maybe it's here. I'm not, and I'm not saying we're the model, because maybe you did it here, and, and you, you reached the same thing. And I know some people say, I've been to church, and, and they were actually kind of mean to me. Anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> they were kind of like, hey, you're not cleaned up. You're not, you're, not, you know, you're not doing it all right, so you know what? Just go away and come back when you're all cleaned up. I didn't experience that. Um, I was a pastor when I was going through a hard time, so I, I came. They didn't know I was a pastor. But I didn't experience that the church just said, go away, because, by the way, I didn't look very good when I came. I was very angry, and my demeanor was very angry. That's not what I experienced. But I'll tell you what I did experience, that, that while the church wasn't exactly aggressive in going, go away, they were passive-aggressive. You know what I mean? It, what I mean by that is, is what I experienced with some, and not all, and some of it, and a lot of it, and in fact, I'll say 75% of it was my fault. Okay, I get it. But, but when I came, what happened to me was is that I experienced some people that all of a sudden, you know, it's like, hey, I got all this whole big thing. I need to get some things off my chest because I'm going through a really hard time. And I kind of got, they kind of handled me. You ever been handled? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like you thought you were having a real conversation with somebody, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I see. This is just kind of your ministry job. This, this is what you do once a week to minister down to the little people. You get it? And I kind of experienced them. Anybody ever experienced that? It's not fun, is it? I don't need that. I don't want that. And just keep pushing it away. And it's like, is there any hope out there? And is there any hope 
in the church, and, and it can be kind of hard. But I will tell you this, that, that one of the things that happened to me was is that I did experience something good, and that was some people came alongside me, some church people, <laughs> and they came alongside me and they said, hey, can we sit down and talk? I, I, I just feel like you got a lot going on. Could, could, could you just come and maybe you can just unpack your bags a little bit? And I did. And they just listened. They didn't, they didn't judge me. You know what I mean? And by the way, most of the stuff I was saying wasn't even correct, and I knew that. I self-corrected a lot of it. But, but it wasn't that they agreed with me or disagreed with me. They listened to me, and they took the time to spend some time with me. And then over a course of time, they started to correct the course to go, maybe you need to think about doing it a little bit differently. And they kind of modeled it for me. And I got to see how church could possibly be. You know what they did for me? They loved me when I was unlovable, because believe me, I, I was. Maybe you're going, you're not so lovable now. <laughs> You should have seen me then. <laughs> Critical. It, you, you know, you know if, if, you, if you meet people that are hypercritical, can I tell you they might be struggling? You might not know that about them, but it's true. If you see people with a mean and angry demeanor, we're going to talk a little bit about it today. But if you see them, I can tell you more than likely they're struggling. It's not probably what you think. Oftentimes, the, f- the, the facade people put on is not what's really going on inside. Be careful that we judge incorrectly. And that's what was going on for me. But you know what the biggest thing they did for me when they shouldn't have? (laughs) They really shouldn't have. They believed in me. They believed in me. They believed the best about me when there was no reason to do that. I can tell you that. They they were saying things like, one day you will be a pastor. And it was like, what? You've got to be kidding. That's not possible anymore. That's done. You get it? But they believed in me back then (laughs) when they probably shouldn't have. That's so important. It it, it literally changed my life. I want to talk a little bit about that today. We're in a series called Hope for a Messed Up Church. If if you missed anything, we're not going to review what we went over in this series, but we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. If you missed any, you can go online and listen to past messages. This is the fifth part of the series, so we covered a lot of things so far and they've been some pretty important things. So, so if you missed it, you can go online, or you can go to the Welcome Center. We actually have CDs. Some of you didn't know, and I just want to make sure you know about that, that you can pick up CDs of any of the past messages. Almost all the messages in this series are out at the Welcome Center, and you can pick them up. If you want to sign up for more, let us know, past series, whatever you want, and we got CDs for that. Um, but today we're going to talk about this. In fact, in fact, i got a slide for it. Who, who can be accepted? Who fits in the church? Who, who can be accepted here? How good do you got to be to get in? You get it? <laughs> and who doesn't? That's, the better, that's a better question. Where is the line that's drawn that says, okay, you're no longer here. Get out. Go away. You get it? And I got some pictures here. I don't know if you can see them. Maybe I'm looking because maybe I don't know how far away you are. But we got people that look like us, and we got some people that don't look like us. And it's funny because we got a crowd that looks like (laughs) pretty much like these pictures. So that's pretty good, right? (laughs) But that's not the point. The point is, no matter which one of these that we're talking about, who can come here and be okay? Not not aggressively say go away, but the passive aggressiveness that says, no, that person... We're done with them. Ah, that person, there's no hope for them. You get it? When do you say that? When do we say that? How does that work? And today we want to take a look at, I believe, one of the most important passages in the entire book of Corinthians, if not the entire Bible. And if we're not careful because of the way it's written, it's so poetic, we'll miss it, as I've missed it. And as I've struggled with this passage this week, and I've looked at it again and again and listened to other people preach on this passage and, and done everything I can to understand this passage, I still don't know if I get it completely, but, but today we're going to cover it because it is so important. If we don't get this, I can tell you, what, what we decide with this passage today will decide what kind of church we will be. I can tell you that. So here we go. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. You can follow on me in your outlines or in your Bibles. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Huh. I thought about being able to play the cymbal. Frenchie won't let me. But, you know. <laughs> 
Okay, so before we get into this too far, I just want to say what we're talking about here is the gifts of the Spirit that we talked about last Sunday. If you missed that, go back and listen to that message because we talked a lot about the gifts of the Spirit. And the first one being one of the most controversial ones we talked about last Sunday, the gift of tongues. And he comes straight out with it, and he's about to give you the same list that we had last week. And we ended last week's message by him saying, I've given you these gifts, and these are important, but, but, but in the, I'm about to tell you the most excellent way. You remember we said that last Sunday? And I said, it's coming next Sunday. Well, here we go. And he's saying, you can speak in all the tongues you want, but if you don't have love, if you don't have the proper motivation, you don't have nothing. He goes on. That's not the only gift he mentions. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy. Are you recognizing the list? It's the same list as last week. (laughs) He's listing out the gifts. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. Knowledge was another one that he mentioned last week. And if I have faith, that was another one that he mentioned last week, that can move mountains. But I do not have love. I am nothing. (laughs) Boy, that's bold, isn't it? Are you telling me somebody that has these gifts and are utilizing these gifts and are doing these things and moving the mountains that God is saying, but don't I have love? You have what? Nothing. You get it? Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor (laughs) and I give my body to a hardship, which means another place I think it burned at the stake, you get it? That I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Nothing. So so let me tell you what I think he's saying here before we get too far. Why you do what you do is as important to God as what you do. I think we can say that. And the reason I'm saying it is, these aren't my words and I struggle with that, but I can tell you this, it does matter to God what your internal motivation is. Because he said it right here. He said, you can do all of these things, all the things we talked about last Sunday that are so important that are the body of Christ, that are gifts of the Spirit, he said, you can manifest all of them. And if you don't have the right motivation, if it's not about love, then you know what? You don't have nothing. You got nothing. Your motivation is important to God. If it's not about, remember Jesus said it, right? Love God and love people. All the laws of the prophets hang on these two. If you don't have that, you got nothing. Nothing, and it's so important for the church. So how do you define love? And today, he's going to define it. And maybe you've heard this passage before. I've read it so many times, I've memorized it. Because I read it at every wedding, okay? <laughs> In fact, we'll, here we go, ready? Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. I want to pause there. Anybody know Petra? Nobody knows Petra? (laughs) Okay, fine. I was going to sing it. Love is patient. Remember, (laughs) love is kind. Okay, they used to sing it, right? this, this, This passage is so poetic, isn't it? I mean, it's so poetic that you could miss it, as I've missed it. And we're going to come back to it because I believe that, that we think of it as poetry. It's almost like, oh, wow, that's great love. I wish I had that kind of love. You know, We want it. It's a sonnet. You know what I mean? And, and so that's how we look at it, and it sounds so great. But, but, but if, you, if, if you don't see verse 7, then you don't get what he's really asking because verse, verse 7 is a result of these other things. So what I like to do is I like to read verse 7 very carefully. Okay? And then I'd like to come back to these other things and, and describe, because I have a feeling we get to verse 7 and you really hear, because you've probably heard it before, but maybe you haven't really heard it like, like I have this week. You may struggle with it when you actually read it. You ready? Love, okay, this is what he's talking about. It always protects, okay? It always trusts. You want me to go any further? Always? Yes. It always believes in people? Yes. That's what it means, right? It always hopes. It always perseveres. So, so can I explain here? 
Are you thinking the same thing I'm thinking is that the Apostle Paul may be a little naive? Hmm? How many trust people? <laughs> uh, how many believe the best in people? As you've seen them, you know who I'm talking about. Every time they go back to this old way of life, you know what I'm talking about? And you're going, I don't think I can trust that that person's going to change their life. Are you kidding me? I know people. <laughs> you see, when it comes to people, do you, this is what I, and I think this passage is beckoning this question, do you believe the best in people or do you assume the worst? Which one? Huh? When it comes to people and you think about them and, and it comes to life change, and I don't, mean, I don't mean not dealing with hard issues, and please don't hear what I'm not saying today because i got a feeling there are some people that are going to struggle with this. The enablers in the room are going to struggle going, well, they think that what we're about to talk about it means enabling more people. We're not having boundaries. That's not at all what I'm talking about. And, and, if, and if you've listened to any of this series, then you would know I'm not talking about that. It's not about watering down the truth. It's not about living in a fairy tale land. And if you think the Apostle Paul did, understand he was martyred for his faith. He suffered just about every day of his Christian life. He was not naive or simple. But he wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he said it always protects, it always trusts, it always sees the best. You get it? Before the person is even there. How do you do that? Huh? How do you assume the best? And you know, here's how you decide what goes in this blank. Because I believe there's a gap. When somebody says, hey, I'm about to change or I want change in my life, there comes a time where you go, you're either believing the best about them or you're assuming the worst. Which one do you do? And it's based on two things. You know what it's based on? It's based on your personal experience, what you see, what you've experienced. And it's based on who you are. <laughs> and what I want to talk a little bit about today is this, what I see in this passage that maybe you've never seen because I know I have it, and I know I'm struggling with it just like other people, is if that's what it's asking us to do, if that's what true love is, where is the problem? Because a lot of us, if we're real honest, and I can tell because the room got a little quiet. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. <laughs> Nobody's even smiling. <laughs> it's okay. Relax. I didn't write this. This is the Bible. It's not new. You've read this verse before. <laughs> just never heard it that way before, have you? It's okay, relax. But we're going to talk just for a few minutes about why we struggle with believing the best. <laughs> why we struggle, because, because there's an internal struggle, and I don't think it's just our experience or what we've seen, although that's part of it, because we've internalized some of it. It's not out there that we have the problem. You know what it is? It's in here. And the material we're going to cover today is nothing new. We've talked about it in many messages, and you go to get some new material. And I go, well, the Bible repeats itself. And we're going to cover the same material. It's not even my material. If you want a great book on it, Andy Stanley wrote a book called Enemies of the Heart. Great book. But it's right here for us to see. The principles are right here for us to see. And the reason we're struggling, and i got to tell you guys, don't miss, don't check out, because here's the problem. If you're struggling with believing the best and trusting, always trusting, always protecting, always hope, always persevering, you're struggling with the things we're about to talk about. That's a sign. That's why I say we read verse 7 first to say it does these things, and if you're not doing those things, then I can tell you you probably are struggling with the first part of this passage and didn't even know it. So here we go. You ready? Let's go back to verse 4. In fact, we'll put it up on the screen. We're going to go back to verse 4, and we're going to look at a few things, and we're going we're to break it apart a little bit. Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. You can end with patience, right? I mean, <laughs> that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> but here's the reason why we struggle being patient and struggling being kind is it does not envy. Can I tell you, I really believe that that is what this is talking about right here. The people that are not patient, the people that are not kind, most of the time are struggling with envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Those things go together. Did you know that? And they go with the problem or the heart problem or whatever, however you want to depict it. They go with the problem of envy. Huh? So let's talk about envy just for a minute. In fact, i got a picture of envy. Anybody ever done this? <laughs> 
I like that one. It's a kid, and those of you online that can't see it, it's a kid who's got a popsicle, but the, the other kid has this big ice cream, and it was like, I like my popsicle until I saw your ice cream, you know? <laughs> this happens to me a lot of times, <laughs> especially at Sweet Frog. I thought this was the biggest one, you know? <laughs> There's a bigger cup? What in the world, right? How come I don't have that? You know? and, and so what is the problem with the envious person, okay? This is important. Because if we're going to get to where God wants us to go, we're going to have to be real honest. And today I'm going to ask you, if you're struggling, believing the best, then I really want you to listen because one of these things is probably going to speak to you. And you're going to go, yeah, 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 not a big deal. Everybody, uh, but it is a big deal. It is a big deal. So here we go. The envious person, the jealous person. How do you describe them? I deserve more than I have, right? (laughs) In fact, just like the kid in the picture I deserve not just more than I have, I deserve what you have. (laughs) You get it? I deserve what you have. So how can you tell if you struggle with envy? Because believe me, guys, no one is going to admit that they struggle with envy, right? Any envious people? (laughs) No, we're not going to admit it, right? But I think it's there. And here's how you can tell. You want to know how you can tell? Ask your spouse if you do this. No, don't ask them. You're You're not ready for that. Do you secretly celebrate other people's failures? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Let's see. The person, the perfect person at work that got the promotion instead of you, and now they're struggling. Do you celebrate that? Hmm? Huh? that, that they stumbled a little bit. Oh, that's kind of funny, right? Or, or, or maybe they got whatever you want, or they're doing something, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, I just don't like that person. And when they stumble, it is the funniest thing in the world for us, right? It works in politics, too, by the way. We won't go there today, but it does. When, when politicians stumble or whatever, instead of Christians praying, I can tell you what happens. They, they laugh and they jeer and they do all these things, and you can f- feel the satire humor coming out. Oh, that's funny. Don't, don't get over it. But it's envious. It's something inside that's going, what is going on? And, and let me tell you something about an envious person. They cannot give a sincere compliment if, you, if you're struggling with that. They can't. They are, it's the hardest thing in the world for them to, to give a compliment. And when they do give a compliment, or someone else gives a compliment, then they feel the need to follow up by saying, I'm not saying, but. Have you ever heard that? I'm not saying, but. Okay, you know, it don't make sense, does it? Well, let me put it differently. Yeah, I know. They did a pretty good job there, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. But you don't know. <laughs> let me tell you about them. I bet you didn't know that they're doing blah, 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 blah. I bet you didn't know how they got this job. I bet you didn't know. You get it? You can't give a sincere compliment. You can't just say, great job, good, great, awesome. Because why? It holds us back. And if you're struggling with the the issue of envy today, it will eat away at you, and it will come out in ways that you don't mean for it, and it's a division. And i got to tell you something, that I believe it goes along with what we talked about last Sunday with the power of the Holy Spirit, that the power of the Holy Spirit will not, in, it, he will not empower a church that's struggling with envy. He won't do it with a person either. And you can manifest tongues, and you can manifest prophecies, and you can manifest, but you have nothing. You get it? If that's what's filling your heart, and that becomes your God, and it will. You get it? This is why it's so important. If envy becomes your God, and you'll know because you can't do it, can you? You can't give a sincere compliment. You know who you are. And some of us got better masks than others, right? And we're we're disguising it. Uh, Well, I needed to tell you about them because, uh, you know, I just thought you needed to know who you're dealing with. I don't want to, or you want to talk to them? No, I'm not going to tell them. Just you. All right? What do you think that is? Envy. And it's killing us. You see? It's, it's, like, it's like having a blockage in your heart. It'll kill us. And it does. Okay, so how do you get rid of it? How, how do you, how, what's the solution? What's the one shot, John, to get rid of envy? There isn't one shot. As there is in none of these. These are not things you just get over. Can I tell you that? And, and, and they're exercises to get over them. Okay? <laughs> Have you heard this before? They are. And the reason I'm saying it is because, yes, a lot of us know, just like we know that we need to lose weight, and exercise, it's worth saying again because we're not doing it. You see, a lot of you say, I've heard this. Yeah, but you're not doing it. So the exercise is this. You want to know what it is? It's going to be hard. How many feel like exercising? Anybody? 
Some of us do, right? Because after a while, you start to enjoy it. And, I, and I, there's some exercises I enjoy now that I, I've started doing them, you know? But when you start, you don't, right? I mean, it's like, this is uncomfortable, right? This is miserable. Why would I want to do this to myself? I don't, and, and, and I'm saying that because this is what's going to happen here. Everybody's going to go, well, I don't feel like doing that. And, and I'll get to why. Okay, so here's, what, here's how to overcome envy. You want to know? Celebrate other people's success. <laughs> well, that's disingenuous, isn't it? Celebrate that person you're making fun of. Oh, well, that's disingenuous, right? If it's the president, write him a letter and say, thank you for what you do. Hmm? You struggle with that, do you? you? You struggle saying thank you for what you do? When the apostle Paul could do it to Caesar, to Nero, to pray for them, thank you, I'm praying for you. Why is that so hard for us? You know why? Because we're struggling with this. And it's killing us. Because we agree with them? No. Well, that would be disingenuous. I don't do things that are disingenuous. Really. Do you think that the feelings are going to come first? If so, you're wrong. The feelings don't come first. You know what comes first? The action. <laughs> start celebrating. Start sending the note. If you can't do it in person, which a lot of us can't, and by the way, it's so phony, please don't do it in person. <laughs> right? As you've seen it, right? The envious person trying to celebrate is so uncomfortable. Oh, I'm so happy for you. You know, <laughs> you know and they're rolling their eyes. They can't help it, right? So write the notes. Start doing it. And it will become part of your life, and you'll realize it's not that I'm endorsing everything. It's not that I don't realize what's going on. What am I doing? I'm believing the best. And I'm leaving some of this other stuff to God. Who made you the judge? Huh? <laughs> it's kind of arrogant to think we're the ones to correct the whole world. Is that what we think? No. Does it mean we never speak out? Are you saying that, John? You know I don't think that. Does it mean we don't become politically active? No. Does it mean that we don't call a spade a spade? No. But can we do it in a loving manner? Yes. The solution is to congratulate other people, and it would be huge in the life of Christians. If you don't think, that it's, if you don't think that's biblical to celebrate people even before they're ready, then I'd like you, then you really don't get the heart of God. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a little harsh. Maybe you're thinking I'm overplaying myself. And maybe you think, well, that's not really biblical to celebrate people as they do, isn't it? Read Luke chapter 15 and see how God views the situation. Luke chapter 15, maybe you've never read it. You've probably heard it, though, if you've been here. Because we've used the prodigal son in more than one occasion, haven't we? And when the prodigal son came home, who has done nothing but come home, the father did what? He threw a robe on him, and he put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and said, my son has come home. He hadn't done a thing yet, has he? He just came home. <laughs> Big deal. He's come home and celebrate. And who had a problem? The whole purpose of the story of the prodigal son, you want to know what it was? It wasn't the prodigal. Maybe you thought it was. It was to the Pharisee, and he said, but, 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 but why are you jealous? Why are you so angry? This son of yours, he squandered all your money on wild living and prostitutes and all this stuff, and he's so mad. You see? It's envy coming out. That's how it comes out. Where's the anger coming from? Couldn't celebrate. You get it? But what did he say to him? Well, we had to be glad and celebrate. He didn't get You know what he did to him? He didn't say, you terrible son, get out of my sight. He didn't say that. He brought him over and he put his arm around his older son. And he said, son, son, everything I have is yours. But we had to be glad and celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. See, he's opening his eyes. You want to overcome your envy, brother? Come to the celebration for your brother and leave the butts out of it. Well, he's in that baptismal pool, but... What? What? I know that. Well, he may not get clean. No, and he never will until you start believing. You get it? Somebody believing when no one else did. You get it? Huh. What does that do for you in that moment? I can tell you that. And we got to break the back. The way we break the back of envy is what we celebrate. 1 Corinthians 13.5 We'll go further, okay? That's envy. If you struggle with it, celebrate. Verse 5, uh, it, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. <laughs> self-seeking. You know what word comes to mind? 
the problem of greed. Huh? Right? Greedy people are <laughs> self You like that one? <laughs> I love it. This kid, she's got all the candy. You get it? And she's so happy, but if you grab one of those pieces of candy, she will punch you in your face. <laughs> She'll bite you. She would bite you right now. She's got candy all over her face. You love it, right? And, and what is the problem for the greedy person? What's the description of greed? Ne- it never get enough, right? How much is enough? It's a little bit more, right? And never satisfied. The problem isn't the amount. It can never, it's a vacuum that can never be satisfied. And so how can you tell if you're a greedy person? It's never enough for you. You get it? Money? materialism, stuff, whatever, wealth. But, but I find in the church world that we get hung up on the greedy side of money, and some of us aren't struggling on the money side of it. Some of us are. Some of us are, and I'll tell you where we struggle, because a lot of people go, I'm not greedy. Yet we're working jobs, and we're working so many hours, and we're so busy trying to maintain lifestyles we can't afford. You want to know why? Because we're greedy. Why can't I do this? Why can't I go on that mission trip? Why can't I give more? Why can't I do things? Because I have a lifestyle that's unobtainable. We don't, we don't think of it that way, do we? That's great. It's, it's too much. You get it? Or we do it with our schedules. That's greed. When we're so busy, we can't do anything. You want to know what that means? Oh, pastors can be that way too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're the worst. Greedy with our time. Greedy with the accolades. You get it? All the kudos for us. You get it? We overdo, we overextend, we're extreme. We stay too long. You get it? We, we can never get enough. We're, we're up too late. We're always overdoing. Supersize me. You get it? We do it with food too, don't we? <laughs> Can't never get enough. Supersize it. Give me more. I need more. It's never enough. You get it? And what's the fear of, of, the, of the greedy person? You know what it is? It's insecurity. I will miss out. That's what it is. If I don't do this, I'm going to miss out on something better. I'm going to be left out. It's insecurity at its finest. So how do we overcome it if you're struggling with it today? Maybe you didn't know. Maybe you just realized that you're struggling with it. Maybe you thought it was just about money or materialism. And you go, I don't really think I was like that. But now that I look at my schedule, <laughs> maybe I am. How do we overcome it? Here's how we overcome it. The solution to the problem of greed is to give. To give that which you're holding on to. You get it? Because the greedy person is, is taking, 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 taking. You see? And now it's time to give back. And you give back what you're struggling with. So, so if you're struggling with the money issue, then give some money. See? If you're struggling trying to be greedy and holding it all to yourself, then sell some stuff and give it away. Let me, let me put it a little differently there. Anonymously. That's harder, isn't it? Not at the church, not so everybody can see. You can give to the church, but by the way, we don't know how much you give, so <laughs> we won't go, wow, look what you gave. There's a reason for that. It's between you and God. I think it's important. But, but, but more than that, we got to walk for life coming up. Maybe you need to sell something and give to that. I don't have any money to give, really. Do you have something to sell? You got too much stuff? <laughs> I don't have time to walk. I get it. I don't have time to help. Start thinking about it. You got a big problem? Write some big checks. <laughs> All right, that's one side. Here's the other one. Maybe it's accolades. You, you want, it's not money for you. Maybe it's like me. I don't have an issue with money. I have an issue with accolades. Get it? I, I want all that credit for me. Oh, you did that. Oh, you built that church. Oh, you did that thing. Oh, you did it. And, and, and believe me, people love it. You know, pastors love it. You go in the hospital room, you think Jesus walked in when you go to the hospital room. It's true. Huh? You know, pastor's here. Oh, pray. Okay, you know. You're so lucky I'm here. You know what I mean? We got it. Give it away. Write some thank you notes. Write some big thank you notes. Start doing some things anonymously. Stop doing it for the credit because it's killing us. And it's sucking the lifeblood out of the church. You get it? Because we're stuck with the issue of greed. I got to move on. The solution, Give. You got a problem with greed? Give. It will break your insecurity. And you'll be surprised how God will fill it in. And you will be blessed, and no one will know why. Don't tell them. That's for you. You get it? Because you got to give what you thought you would hold on to, and you will break the back of greed. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it goes on to say this. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
You know the problem I see here? Maybe you know. Anger. Anger. Now, <laughs> for some of us, we're going, well, anger is not bad, right? Is that what we say? Jesus got angry, didn't he? Yes, he did. And he didn't sin, right? He was angry and didn't sin. And yes, you're right. He turned over the chain. We went, I went to see Son of God this week. I highly recommend it. It's great. And he turns over the money changer's tables. Oh, it's awesome, you know? Wouldn't that be great? He, throwing the change. There. My father's house is not to be a house of, of, of thieves. You get it? It's to be a house of prayer. And he's setting things straight. And he's angry. There's nothing wrong with the emotion of anger. It's normal. It's healthy. It's normal. Things that are bad make you angry. That's good. You know what's wrong with anger? Is when it has you, there's a big difference. And some people are writing it off as, oh, I'm just angry because of what? But no, it's got you. And everything is about anger, and everything is being forced out. And it's this thing, and you go, how do I know if I'm struggling with anger or bitterness? You want to know what bitterness is? It's buried anger. It is. And it will come back out on it. These little resentments. And they're there, and they're seeping away at your life, and you're drinking the poison every day of your life. The description of an angry person is this, angry people are hurt people, you know? They're hurt. Somebody took something from them, you get it? Somebody took something from you. Somebody did something to you that they shouldn't have, you get it? And there's a debt that needs to be repaid to the angry person. How can you tell if you're an angry person? You want to know? <laughs> you having any imaginary conversations? You know what I'm talking about? Are you driving down the road and all of a sudden you find yourself talking to yourself or talking to this other person that you're angry at? Don't look at the person. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? You're angry with them and you're talking to them and, and you're winning the argument in the car. <laughs> and when people ask you, people ask you because you're Christian, everything okay? Everything's fine. I'm good. We need to have Matthew 18, bring everybody in, and we'll have a big conversation. We'll talk about this. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm good. I'm good. Can I tell you? Christians got to stop saying it. I'm good. You know what it means? No, you're not. <laughs> I'm good with it. I'm good. Don't need to talk about it. I've got over it. It's ridiculous. And we go around so mad and so angry, and the fear for the angry person, I know because I spent a good portion of my life here, and can I tell you something, angry people? It's easy to go back. If you think you can just get over it overnight for some things, you can't. It is a daily thing. It is a daily reprieve. Believe me. I won't get what I deserve. And worse, neither will they. You get it? I want them to pay. They owe me. They're going to get by with it. You know, that's what I struggled with God for years. You're going to forgive them, aren't you? How could you do that? Why would you do that? I can't let it go. You want to know what the symbol of it for the angry person? You'll know if you're that person. Because when you get around them, or, or when you start talking about those things, you'll know about me. I get loud, louder, and get animated, and your fists will clench on it. Isn't that the symbol? I will never let it go. You know what I'm talking about? Some of us are right there. I'll never let this go. And I will always assume the worst because of it. You get it? I can't believe in another person. They will do the same thing. You get it? That's the symbol, guys. What's the solution to the problem of anger? I think you already know. That's the symbol of anger. That's the symbol of forgive, isn't it? Hardest thing you'll ever do, right? The day you're forgiven, that's one thing. But the day you learn to forgive, that's a whole different thing. Isn't it? But Jesus says it right when he says, you know, God can't forgive you your sins if you don't forgive other people. You know, I used to think, why would you say that? You mean it's conditional? It's because of something I did, now I'm saved because of something I did, or I sustained my salvation by something I did. And that's not the truth. The truth is, is you cannot be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and be filled with anger. Get it? you got to choose. And I'm going to tell you this. 
It will be the hardest thing you've ever done, but I can tell you this, this will be the best thing you've ever done too, is to let it go to God. And can I tell you something for those of you that are angry? It will come back, and God will be there again and again and again and again, and you can forgive. It is possible. But I will tell you this, it's impossible to assume the best as long as you've got an angry heart. It really is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. One more problem. The person who does not delight, who does delight in evil, but doesn't rejoice in the truth, is the guilty. <laughs> the problem of guilt. How could you be mad at that, right? <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> right? Have you ever seen that face? But in the other room, you're going, what came in here? A dinosaur? You know? <laughs> Chewed everything. That's what they look like, right? A guilty person. Guilty people. How can you tell if you're a guilty person? You want to know about a guilty person? The last two are the hardest. The envy and the, and the je- jealousy and, and, the, and the, the greed are all hard. But I can tell you this, the angry person is hard. But the hardest one in the world is guilty because that's really what it comes down to. You have a secret. And nobody knows your secret. You get it? The guilty person doesn't trust people because they can't be trusted. If you find someone very suspicious... <laughs> If you find somebody that has struggles trusting, boy, we're coming right down to what he's talking about here, right? Always trust. You know who can't trust? The guilty. Because they understand you can't be trusted because I can't be. (laughs) You got an accountant like that? You better look at your books. You get it? (laughs) They only have surface relationships. They're the most superstitious. They're the most uh, suspicious people in the world. They're micromanagers oftentimes. Some of that is personality type, but, but... But some of it's because they can't let nobody get too close. Why? Because they have a secret. And because they have a secret, they lie to cover up their secret. And they'll keep lying to cover up their secret. And if you get too close to their secret, you know what happens? They react emotionally. And some of you have experienced it, and you didn't know why. You didn't know why the person responded the way that they did. And now maybe you're getting it. It's like, they become sad, they become angry. For men, default is anger, so it's like, it could be the gamut of why we get angry. It's, it's just everything defaults to anger. But when they react that way, it's like, oh, where, why? What, what, what is that about? Because you got too close to their button. Or they check out, they're just like, hmm, done. You go, who offended them? What happened? What, what is that? No, 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 you got too close to them. You got too close to them because they can't trust. You getting it? Always trust. You can't trust. Because you're guilty. You get it? I can't trust you because I can't let you inside of me because you might find out about me. And they try to compartmentalize. Some of you know. Some of you soldiers, you know. But you know it doesn't work too, don't you? Not in your personal life. It comes out whether you like it or not. Or inside that box that you choose to compartmentalize, you are treating people in wrong ways and you go, I didn't even know I was doing that because I've compartmentalized my emotions and now I can't, I've shut off my emotions. And they can be just so cold, you get it? But it's because it's all buried inside. No one can forgive me. Nobody can know about what's going on for me. Nobody can know these things about me. Maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something somebody else did. But there's guilt. And there's fear. So let me ask you a question. Do you have a secret? What is it you hope nobody finds out that's killing you? You get it? Not sharing for the sake of sharing, but something that you're going, it weighs on me all the time. It's what I hope nobody ever finds out about me. I don't want anybody to get too close. I can't ever let anybody get too close. I don't know why I'm like that. Maybe you don't even realize you're doing it, except for you know the symptoms now. You know you're sick. You just didn't know what the root was. Now you do. Because you're going, I can never let anybody get too close. Get it? You can come here. That's it. You get too close. I'm out. Maybe now you know. Guilty. Get it? So how do you overcome guilt? <laughs> Confess. These aren't hard things, are they? Except they're hard to do, aren't they? Same symbol. You know why I used it? Because it's the same. Whether you're to forgive or to be forgiven, the guilty person is doing the same thing. 
I want you to see what I got. I'll protect this with everything. In fact, I'll make it even worse to protect the secret. You get it? And the answer is this. You see, God already knows your sin. Jesus certainly knows he's got stripes on him for him. He's already paid for that. You're okay going to him. You know that, right? Maybe you're having a hard time admitting it to yourself. I don't know. But confess your sins to God. And he says he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The only person that can't be saved, you know who it is? The one that won't confess. The one that keeps pushing back going, I don't I don't, I don't, I don't have that. So will you confess? Will you get it out before God? Because you can't trust people. You can't do with this passage. We can't become the church God is saying. As long as we're just living in guilt and not getting beyond it. Who do you think wants us to live that way? <laughs> Who loves secrets and lies? And wants to hold that over you every day. And before you do it, it's, it's not that bad. Go ahead and do it. And after you do it, it's, you're so bad, you better never tell anybody about it. And keep it in the dark. You get it? It's Satan. You know, God had it right. He said, confess it to me. Confess your sins to God. I love what I saw this week. Confess your relational problems to God, not on Facebook. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but, but do you have anybody you can trust? Because some people go, oh, I, I talked to God about it, really. But have you talked to another person about it? Well, I don't have to. No, you don't. Except for James says it in James chapter 5. When it says people were unhealthy and some of them were sick to the point of death. And they said, why are we like this? And he said, because you have sin. And he said, confess your sins to God. But he also said this, James 5 verse 16. Maybe you need to look it up. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed physically, yeah, but more than that, spiritually and in the heart. You get it? Some people know what that feels like. There is, a, there is an ache that's inside that is the loneliest place you may ever be. You get it? So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is a powerful and effective Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to find a safe place. Maybe you need to find a safe person and start unpacking some of your bags. Now, this is not just talking about confessing it to anyone. It's talking about, it says, call the elders of the church. They might lay hands on you, that they might talk to you and confess what's going on in your life, that they might pray for you so they can judge you? No. So they can give their spin on it? No. So that they can pray for you and so that you can be forgiven and you can be healed and you can be restored that God might be able to use you. You see, maybe you think, well, I'll just live with it. Yeah, you can if that's where you want to go. But the passage we're talking about today is saying if you choose to do that, you will do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. And yeah, you might be able to live with that and you might even go to heaven. But what about the other people? You get it? Nothing breaks the power of secrets like confession. So that's what holds us back, guys. We'll come back to verse, set, verse 7, okay? Now we're ready for it. If you deal with these things, if you give them to God and you, and you exercise and you get rid of these things, then here's what happens. Love will always protect. It will always trust. It will always hope. It will always persevere. <laughs> these are hard things, aren't they? You see, see I, I got a slide I want to put up for you. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the difference between, it, it's, it's the space. You, you get these little symbols, you get them on your navigation, navigation tools. If you want to chart a course, and between these two places, between somebody's, the expectations you have for somebody and their behavior, there is a space. There's a space for you. There's a space between stimulus and response, and in that space, you have the ability to choose what to do in that situation, right? But can I tell you on the other side of that, because, because that works for you as an individual. But now we're talking about someone else, okay? Past yourself. The person you're praying for, the person that's struggling, the person you go, maybe they can make a change in their life. There is a space between the expectations you have of them and their behavior. And how you fill in this space is critical. That's what this verse is all about. I really believe it. It always trusts. It always protects. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Let me tell you. In this space decides what kind of church we will be and whether the Spirit of God will go with us. 
Is that important? <laughs> yes. We can do all the Easter campaigning we want. We can sing the best and we can have all the things. Oh, we can speak in the tongues of men and angels. Oh, we could prophesy. We could give our body. We could give everything we got to the poor. And without this, we will have nothing. You get it? That's what he's saying. What kind of church do we want to be? Here's, here's what we can put in the blanks. You ready? Are we going to believe the best? Or are we going to assume the worst? If we choose to assume the worst, you know what it means? Here's what it means to that person. No matter what you do, you'll never live up to my expectations. That's what it's saying. When we choose to assume our worst, it means no matter what you do, you'll never live up. The most powerful thing you can do is to fill in the gap. By believing the best, really is. And, and for some of you, you're struggling right now because you think what that means is, is that we're going to start enabling. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean we don't have tough conversations. It doesn't mean we don't break fellowship with people at times. It doesn't mean we don't do the hard things that a church has to do and that people of God have to do. It doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. In fact, if that's who you are and you're enabling, you're not helping them. In fact, you're assuming the worst. Because you don't even believe that person can change. You get it? Or you think, like I've thought, that you are the Messiah. Is that the problem? We, we got all kinds of Christians with Messiah complexes going, I'm going to fix your problem, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to fix you. And you're looking at one of them that has made that mistake. And I want to change, guys. But I want to change to understand this, that as we give out the needs and as we start to say, here's a path, and the person goes, I'm going to do that. In that moment where that person says, I want to do that, what will you put in the space? Hmm. Believe the best. Love always trusts. I don't trust. Yeah, I know. Because you got a heart blockage. The reason we don't trust is because we haven't given it to God. You get it? Because we have a problem with envy. We got a problem with greed. We have a problem with anger and unforgiveness. Oh, and guilt. You know who really hates the sinner? Is the one that's most like them. Because if, if they get too close to me, they'll realize that underneath this mask is them. You get it? What will we put in this space, guys? <laughs> Every time there's a gap, will you choose to accept or reject? This is important. This is pivotal. This is who we are. When they come, they're already here. What will you do? Will you accept or reject? Well, they don't deserve it. No, they don't. And you know what Jesus said about that? Jesus taught on this. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Not how they done you. You get it? I asked myself for years, how could you have believed in me? It doesn't make sense. But it made all the difference. <laughs> but it made all the difference. Verse 8, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. There's all kinds of things in this verse that we could explore. But for today, you want to know what I think he's saying? Don't trade the great commandment for the great commission. What do I mean? Don't trade what you do for why you do it. What is the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The great commission is to go into the world and preach the gospel. And he's saying one day that will be done. But you know what will go into eternity? 
Only one. No tongues, no gifts, no pastor, nothing but love. (laughs) Maybe I can put it different. Don't trade rules for how you treat people. Don't trade how, don't, 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 don't take your rules and, and decide that that's the issue and that now it doesn't matter how we treat people because it does and it matters why you treat them that way and what you're doing, not just that you're effective, not just that you're pragmatic, but why you do what you do to God is just as important as what you do. If this doesn't make it clear, I don't know what to say because he said everything else will pass away. That's what he said. That's not my words. That's his. Verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childhood. I put my childhood behind me. (laughs) You know what he's saying? Stop being childish. (laughs) Grow up, church. Verse 12, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I, will, I shall know fully, even as I am known. I've struggled with that passage. I've read it many times. I've <laughs> read many commentaries on it. But, but here's what I understand, the best of my knowledge. It's talking about the end of time. Now I see through a glass dimly. But then I will see face to face. Could, could, I, could I put some context on here and say this? That he's saying that if you want to see the kingdom of God, love another person. You don't have to wait for eternity. That if you want to see the face of God, then love another person. The way he's talking about here, it always protects. It always trusts. It always perseveres. It always hopes. You get it? Love like that, and you will understand the kingdom of God. Verse 13, and now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. (laughs) The greatest is love. (laughs) So the question I have today is this. What will you put in the space what, what will you put in the space? When, when people come here, what will we choose to put in that space as a church? The conventional wisdom, the religious wisdom? Who can be accepted? Who, who, who can get in? Better question. Who can we help get in? Who who can we believe in before they should be believed in? You know, like somebody did for you. Like somebody did for me. Or did we forget? Have we forgotten? So here's my challenge, guys. Before Easter, we got to answer this question. We got a decision to make, guys. What will you do? If you're struggling with those things, will you choose to keep hiding it? And act like we don't know that it exists because we know it does. You know why we know? Because we're not reaching all the ones yet, are we? And I got a feeling it's because the Spirit isn't going with us because we're struggling internally. But we need to give it to God so we can reach the one while there's still time. We can't love the way we should as long as we're holding on to this. Do you get it? Are we ready? <laughs> What kind of day would that be? What we put in this space is determined by what we do before it. Because we can't trust that way, can we? We we can't love this way, can we? Really? You know that, right? I mean, you got to know that we can't love like that. We can only do it with the love of God, and we can only have the love of God when we release to God. You get it? And it will determine what we put in this space. And what we put in this space will determine what kind of church we will be. 
Let's stand for prayer. Father, I don't really know what to say (laughs) other than I want that kind of love. And the truth is, is I don't think I have it. (laughs) And if we're real honest, most of us would say we don't have it. We want it, but we don't have it. And I pray that today, God, that we open our hearts. Lord, I pray for the one that doesn't know you, (laughs) that they can know you today. That they can understand that your one and only son came and died for their sins. And then I pray for us as a church, Lord, as people that that claim to be your followers. I pray that we'll really explore this hard to go, is there anything we're holding back from you? Is there anything keeping us from loving? Because I know, God, the stakes are high. Oh, not for us. We're, We're saved. I know that. But what about the other one? What about the people who need us to believe in them like somebody believed in us? What will we do with that? And Lord, I know it's tricky because we have to have boundaries and we have to not enable and we have to do all these other things. So how are we going to do it? (laughs) We need you. And I know what you're asking for, God, is you're saying, would you give yourself to me? Would you open up your heart and not hold back this time? I want to do that, God. And I pray in this room today, God, that as we explore ourselves, that we won't leave here today with greed and envy and anger and guilt. I pray today, God, we leave here empty. Not empty, God, filled. Because when you fill us, you will push out all that other stuff. When we truly open ourselves up to you, Lord, we will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know what that's like. There is nothing like it. And we can can do the gifts and we can do all the things, but more than that, we can have the love that only God can give. Because, Lord, if we don't have that love, you already said it. If we don't have the love that you want us to have, if we don't dispense the love you want us to have, we have nothing. And we know that. We know that's true. So, God, I pray. Be with us as a church, Lord. Help us to fill this space by believing. Believing the best. I want to be that kind of church, God. (laughs) We're not there yet, but I want us to be that kind of church. And I hope that there'll be some people that want to join that and be part of that. Your church. Your church, God. Not mine. I want to be part of it. So, God, I pray for that today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.